Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. These are the monthly uh, coffees with the mayor and the city manager. Um, as usual, I want to do what I want to do is just give you a little update of what's going on and then answer your questions. Uh, this week has been a very, very busy week in terms of trying to deal with um, managing our sewer debt. Um, as you probably know, uh, just a little history, the voters in 2001 agreed under pretty much threats uh, to put in a sewer system, agreed to spend $463 million. They bonded for that. It came in two years ahead of schedule, three, and we spent $340 million. So we, we were $120 million roughly under budget. Notwithstanding all of that, it was primarily debt funded, some 90 odd percent debt funded. And that debt is pretty much front loaded. For instance, for the next 10 years, 10 to 11 years, we owe $21 million a year before it starts ratcheting down. So basically what's happening is today's residents is paying for a sewer system that was built for tomorrow's residents. There is, we're only using about 60% of capacity, I believe it is. And we built it that way uh, for growth so we wouldn't have to start all over and spend a lot more money. So we have been trying to find a solution to dealing with that uh, sewer debt. We have explored a number of, uh, we have given a number of options with the, the people that hold the debt. It's a state agency called uh, WIFA, Water Infrastructure Finance Authority. Uh, we have been unable to get those folks to cooperate. And so then we began exploring private sector solutions. We are also, because uh, even with the private sector solution, uh, we've been now told by WIFA that if we wanted to pay off their debt with them, they want anywhere, the last estimates we saw was 20 plus million dollars in penalties, um, which is not in our contract. It's not in our contract. And um, they will say that while it isn't in your contract, we changed our policies, and so we, under their sole discretion, can change the terms and condition of our contract at any time. Imagine your mortgage company coming to you and saying, I want to pay off my mortgage, and they say, great, but you're going to owe me another $100,000 in prepayment penalties, but I don't have a prepayment penalty in my contract. Well, that's our new policy. And that's the way it's going to be. So I went to Sonny Borelli, Representative Borelli, and he has run a bill uh, through the legislature that passed through the House 42 to 16, indicating that that agency cannot retroactively apply policies uh, or uh, retroactively and unilaterally change agreements. Uh, without the city's consent, all cities. It's not just us. Every city in town in Arizona, they're doing this too. Uh, then, I, then it went to the House, went to the uh, Water and Energy Committee. I testified at that committee. It passed through the House six to one. And I've t been told now that the one no vote has changed her mind, and she will be voting yes on the floor. Uh, we're getting their attention. The governor's office has come to us and asked for a little time to see if they can't work out a solution with WIFA. Our attorneys have asked the same thing. Uh, the Arizona Corporation Commission have asked the same thing. The treasurer's office has asked us the same thing. So what happens last, just before we, were, we went down to Phoenix to talk to the private sector folks, we get a letter from WIFA with a proposal. You'll love their proposal. What we wanted them to do was we would pay off certain early loans to the extent uh, that we have available cash. And then we wanted them to take the rest, the remainder of it, and spread it over 20 years because today's interest rates are about 1.4 or 5% lower than we currently have. Therefore, by doing that, 
We don't have to raise rates. Uh, we have predictable annual payments for the next 20 years, and we have a lower interest rate. Here was their solution to our issue. You give us 40 to $50 million, and we'll lower your payments. That's it. That was their solution. Give us 40 plus million dollars, and we'll lower your payments. That's like, again, you go back to your mortgage company, and you say, you know, these payments are, I apologize, they're unaffordable, I've lost my job, whatever, and I'd like to refinance to make something more affordable. And they go, well, no, but if you need your payments lower, if you just give me $100,000, we'll lower your payments. That's basically what their offer was. Um, it was disappointing, but that's what we have been dealing with for three years. Um, so that bill will probably go through. Um, we did meet with the private sector folks uh, for a very long meeting on Friday. Uh, we had uh, our financial consultants, our attorneys there. Um, what we were exploring was uh, the, what we always call the Guggenheim deal, which is, uh, it's, a, it's an investment banker where they brought forth the possibility of using a, a public authority. Um, the city would contract with that public authority to provide services. Make a long story short, since we decided not to use um, an independent operator, we're, we want the, what we're doing right now, city employees operating the systems, uh, then that authority really doesn't bring anything to the table. It really doesn't. Because one of our questions was, well, if we go through the authority, can we get a lower rate? Because they might have a better bond rating. And we were thinking of using what's known as the Wisconsin Public Finance Authority. And the answer was no. Your, the uh, interest rates are going to depend on your rating, not the public authorities. Um, <clears throat> we said, well, what other advantages? Well, it, you might have a project later on that you want to use it for. Well, frankly, we can set up our own authority later on if that's really the right answer. So probably what we're going to end up doing, unless WIFA comes to their senses, is a, um, a private deal where we just simply issue our own bonds and pay off WIFA. And with any luck, that bill goes through, and we'll hand them a check without their blood money. Because we, it is just incredible that they want to charge you folks 20 plus million dollars because we're paying them off. We're their largest customer. and. Uh, you know, if they treat their largest customer like this, can you imagine how they treat a small city and town as a customer? It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, so we're, we're looking at that. We wanna, um, we're going to put the pros and cons together. Charlie and I are going to be working on that um, so that we can present it to the city council, um, showing option A, B, and C, so to speak. Uh, we do know this. If we don't do anything, and we haven't raised rates in five years. In fact, the, when we quit raising rates, the project was still going. So if we don't do anything, rates have to go up because there, was, there is more debt than when we stopped raising rates. And we've been using reserves to deal with that while hoping that WIFA would provide us a solution. So we've seen a couple scenarios. We're not, um, it's all this is dependent on interest rates, but we could, depending on the rate and, and how it gets structured, uh, our $21 million in payments might get us back down to $15 million, but that's workable for us. Uh, right now, we actually take $4 million a year out of other reserves to make the payment because this system does not generate enough revenue to, to pay for operations and to pay for the debt. So um, again, we're going to see what we can do, but uh, <laughs> it's been a struggle to say the least. Um, and I know WIFA is uh, quite upset with us, but I honestly have to admit I don't care because we played nice for many, many years and, um, and they 
totally disrespected this city. Um, it, if you were to attend any of the meetings, you would be astonished the way we were treated. I mean, they would scoff at us when we would make a request. Um, the amazing part is when I went and talked to the, or spoke at the Senate committee hearing and at the uh, House committee hearing, Wiffa literally said, we have never told, we don't know what Lake Havasu is talking about. We've never told them no. But when pressed, they finally had to say, well, we don't really tell them no, we just table it for three years. When they said, we don't have penalties, and somebody asked the question, well, what is Lake Havasu talking about? We really don't know. And then when I got up there and explained that the penalty is that if you have, if, if you, according to WIFA, if you haven't paid on your debt for at least 10 years, they want 10 years worth of interest, even though you paid it off in year five. They still want the final five years of interest. So they kind of got caught with their hands in their pockets, uh, the committees quickly realized that they were not uh, being forthright with uh, the legislature. So, but that's, again, that's kind of how they operate. The amazing part, they report to nobody. They don't report to the governor. They don't report to the legislature. They're a standalone independent agency, and we're now looking into ways to change that. That should not be. It should at least be, they should at least report to the executive branch. And uh, that's probably going to be our next thing to work on. So uh, on a happier note, uh, we're moving along in terms of, uh, the, well, the Sierra Park water line is now complete. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, has the RFP gone out for the, uh, looking at the fields assessment? Uh, yes. the. Um the fields assessment study contract is coming before council on uh, March 10th, Tuesday, uh, for approval, and then it'll, it'll be about a six-month-long study, and that's a, a playing fields assessment study, and the uh, scope of work includes uh, evaluating our current inventory of playing fields in the city, and also um, and what the carrying capacity of those fields is with respect to tournament play. Uh, there is a lot of tourist dollars to be had in tournament play uh, for, um, for kids' sports, actually, for um, soccer and softball and baseball. Uh, those tournaments, if you can get into that circuit, can bring a lot of folks to town and put a lot of heads in beds, as we call it, and uh, bring a lot of tourism dollars to the city. Uh, and it's a clean industry. So it's the kind of thing that uh, would, uh, would help us here in the city. Uh, one, of, one of the components in that study that I have requested, though, is a, a lodging component. Uh, I wouldn't want to propose to council and the community that we build uh, millions of dollars worth of playing fields on the prospect of bringing thousands of people to town if we don't have affordable lodging for them when they're here. Bullhead City enjoys a very active tournament play um, scenario up there, but then of course they have uh, thousands of rooms across the river in Laughlin, and a lot of those uh, uh, hotels are willing to give uh, serious breaks to for overnight stay for uh, parents and, and players and the uh, support people that go along with those tournaments that come to Bullhead City. So, um, so that that uh, study will take about six months, as as I said, and. Uh, uh, then we'll evaluate what comes back, and then we'll look at um, uh, you know what's available to us, what the potential is, and then it might also, if it, if it if it does come back and say you know you you could bring a lot of people to town, but you don't have enough places for them to stay overnight, then that actually could end up being a good marketing tool for the partnership for economic development folks to go out into uh, the market uh, of uh, hotel builders and say, you know what, if, if you build it, uh, we will build these fields and, and we can virtually guarantee that uh, with tournament play we can keep heads in your bed, so to speak. So uh, it, um, it, it holds a lot of promise and I'll be anxious to see how that uh, report uh, turns out. Yeah, we, we chose to go 
to hire somebody to assess the needs because the last thing we want to do is go on the basis of build it and they will come. And so we spend millions and millions of dollars and nobody shows up. The other piece of that is to make sure that the, these tournaments are all on circuits. Um, they, they visit certain tournaments and we want to make sure that it's not oversaturated and we would be able to quote unquote break into that circuit um, because fields are not cheap. They are not cheap. Uh, the other thing we've got to do is uh, that we're assessing right now and we'd like to work, we could have worked with WIF on this. Um, is to do um, some effluent to those parks so we're not using water you know, for any of the new parks. And that was something that we actually proposed to, to WIFA uh, on this 20-year refi that I was talking about. Um, they don't like to refi anything. They say they don't, it's against their policy to have a refinance. But if you add a project, it's no longer a refinance. So we said, fine, we'll, let, we'll add some effluent lines for the potential of these new parks. But again, uh, I'm going to try again. I, I actually owe them a letter, and we're going to repropose all of this one more time um, and see what happens. The uh, 280 project is um, a little bit on hold at the moment, only because uh, the, as you know, we were working with Arizona State Parks so that they could put in a mainland launch ramp. And they now have a new director under the new governor. The old state parks director is gone. They've got a new one. And uh, she, we are supposed to see her April, yeah. April 7th. Is that right? Yeah, April yeah. 7th. Um, and, uh, and I know Representative Borelli, once again, is working on uh, finding some funding to help state parks move that project mm -hmm. along. Uh, we'll see. It's a tight budget this year and next year uh, from the governor, so I don't hold out a lot of hopes, but I sure appreciate uh, Sonny thinking about Lake Havasu City and trying to, to help us. That'd be a great project, as, as I've said. Uh, the communities wanted a mainland launch ramp for more than two decades. And when I first came here, that's all I ever heard was, <laughs> we need a mainland launch ramp. And uh, the uh, and, and all the time, they always tried to figure out a way to build it. Never happened, never happened. So now that we have control of those 280 acres, it's right next to state parks. We, we have that opportunity, not to mention the private property down underneath, closer to the water, that would bring a lot of uh, jobs uh, because they want to do homes and commercial. So uh, you have, end up with a lot of construction jobs and then ongoing jobs with the commercial element of that project. Uh, update on Site 6, I know we hired an uh, architect. Yeah, out at Site 6, um, those of you who were here a couple of coffees ago heard me talk about um, the change in focus at Site 6. At one point, um, we had, uh, had budgeted uh, feasibility study money to look at Site 6 uh, as an entire site, which basically it's only six acres. Uh, but, and most of it's parking, of course, but um, it was always my assumption, and I had been told many years ago by someone at, at, uh, at the city that that old brick building that's out there at Site 6 adjacent to the launch ramp uh, was, um, was unsound, structurally unsound, it was uninhabitable, it, was, uh, it, it needed to be brought down before it falls down and somebody gets hurt, and I had that in my mind, but then a couple of coffees ago there was um, someone that came to the coffee, and I'm looking to see if he's here. He's not here. Uh, I didn't get a name because I'd like to give him credit. He he spoke up and said, "Well, what about that building out there?" And then I shared with him what I just shared with you that it was always my assumption that that building had to come down, and that would be a part of that redevelopment effort out at Site Six. And uh, he he said, "No, you that that building has historical value." And so it got me to, to wondering and thinking, and, and the next day I contacted the museum and asked, uh, uh, asked um, uh, Becky at the museum uh, if she could find something in their archives that could give me some information about that building and just what its history is. I assumed it was a, still a relic of the old um, Army airfield out there and, and uh, it was just a leftover. 
Well, uh, she came right back with photos and um, information about that building. It, in fact, uh, was the first uh, brick, or the first structure that McCulloch um, built in Lake Havasu City, and he built it for his outboard motor test facility. That was the facility. And uh, I've got some really neat old photographs of uh, that facility when, in fact, it was in use as McCulloch's outboard test facility. And so it became immediately apparent to me that, in fact, that building does have historical value by Lake Havasu City standards. Of course, we don't really have a lot of, of heritage to, to draw from in this community because it's just not that old. And um, so I began to, to think about how uh, we might be able to capitalize on that building, actually uh, repurpose it, put it back into public use, make a, some kind of a public gathering place out of it, and, and make it cool. And uh, so it, we, it, I contacted the uh, staff who was about to put out a request for proposals on the entire Site 6 development project. And we, we rewrote the scope of work to essentially concentrate on that building to determine what, you know, what is, it, is it structurally sound? Uh, is there asbestos? Is there a way to preserve and, and repurpose and, uh, and rebuild that building in some way to make it a, a public uh, a usable space? And so that uh, RFP went out. Uh, we got uh, three bids back. Uh, we, it was awarded to a local uh, architect, Paul Selberg, and uh, we expect, and they're doing the uh, structural analysis first as the first phase of the project, and I expect that in the coming, work, coming weeks we'll get, get that first report back to determine how, how sound is that building. And, and I've, I've had our own inspectors go through it and, and uh, folks who are in the know in that regard, and actually the, the building looks like it has pretty good bones. So, uh, I mean, it's not slipping, it's not falling, it's not, I mean, it's, it, there's very few even cracks in it, which is unusual for a, a mortar structure uh, that close to the water. So, so that's, that holds a lot of promise. It's a, a project that, quite frankly, I, I find very exciting to think about. And, uh, uh, you know, that uh, upper floor, you know, there's almost 3,600 square feet on the top floor and almost as much on the bottom floor. So uh, right about 7,000 square feet to work with. And uh, it's, it's not a very wide building. It's probably not much wider than this room, but it's very long. And, uh, and it's in a, a, a very picturesque place on the lake. I mean, everybody who knows Site 6 out there can understand uh, the beauty of that, that spot. And if we can develop that building and even maybe even put a, an upper deck on top of it, that uh, it would become a, a very popular place for a coffee shop or a, uh, a, a convenience store down below, a bait, and, a bait store and maybe a bar. And, uh, so we'll, we'll see what the architect comes back with as far as a structural analysis and some ideas along with renderings on uh, what we might be able to do with that building out there. So I'm looking forward to that. Dean? I talked to uh, Paul the other night at a meeting and he said that he was finished with his work so you should see that oh, perfect. pretty soon. Great, great. I know he was excited about it too. So, um, and he's very creative and uh, very accomplished architect and, and has uh, done some wonderful work uh, in the region and the state. So uh, I'm, I'm anxious to see what he comes up with. It's gonna be something that's fun. Two uh, other things, and we'll open it up for questions. Uh, for those of you who are interested, today at 1130 at the Aquatic Center is our NOVA graduation. Uh, it, that is a drug awareness program that our police department puts on for our uh, children uh, at the elementary schools. It's a great, uh, it's a great graduation. Uh, there's lots of kids, a lot of kids. All the grade schools are there, and um, it's, uh, it's pretty fun to just watch that whole graduation. The, um, and then finally, uh, Veterans Court, as you know, we started a Veterans Court about a year and a half ago. It has uh, been highly, highly successful. The uh, Congressman Gosar will be here next Friday, I believe it is. Next Friday for one of our graduations. It is uh, receiving national attention. It is uh, one of the 
a few rural veterans treatment courts in all of the United States. And uh, we are now trying to put together a regional veterans court. And uh, we're very close. We're working with Bullhead City and Kingman to accomplish that. And the county. And, and, the county. and if we do, we will be the only rural regional veterans treatment court in all of the United States. Uh, so we, you know, it's funny when we started that program, uh, we thought we might get five or 10 veterans coming through. And uh, it's more like 35 to 40 at any given moment. We've had many graduate. Um, when uh, I was there last, in fact, Charlie was there as well, we, we had uh, Mayor Brady from Bullhead City to watch the Veterans Court. And uh, I watched it with a lot of pride, but probably I had more pride when I went out in the hallway and one of the veterans that was going through the treatment court came to me and said, thank you so much for starting this. Just a few months ago, I was homeless. And I, start, I got in a little bit of trouble, came through the court. Um, through the resources that they have, they found me a place to live. And now I'm uh, working to be on the straight and narrow. And I would, I'd be right now in jail if this court had not started. And uh, so I'm, I'm incredibly proud of uh, Judge Kalali, who runs that court, and the job he's done. He's a veteran, so he gets it. But if you're interested, go to one of our court sessions. They're the second and fourth uh, Friday of every month. They start at 1 o'clock. It's unlike any other court you will see. Very, very different. So I would encourage you to go. Um, and you'll see just why that court is so effective. Um, by the way, they, they judge effectiveness on what they call the recidivism rate, which is how often does somebody that comes to court come back? They oftentimes call them frequent flyers. Um, usually in a regular court, it's 75 to 80% of somebody that came to court comes back again for whatever reason. In veterans court, it's more like 10%. So it works. It really, truly works. So um, if you have an opportunity, go to it. And again, May, uh, March next Friday, Congressman Gosar will be there, and so that'd probably be a great time to be in that veterans court and watch what happens. We'll have a graduation next Friday, too, so that's pretty cool. It's at the courthouse. On, on <laughs> where else? Drive. On, yeah. col <laughs> on College Drive. Uh, yeah, and it's usually court in, is that right? Yes. At, all the way to the end of the hall. So, that was my wife giving me a jab here. <laughs> uh, so anyway, okay, so they're telling me I got to move over this way. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently the camera doesn't stretch all the way over there. <laughs> oh, uh, it's, that was a halo. <laughs> uh, anyway, let me open it up for questions. Yes, sir. Tom Sauter, East yes. Street Industrial Center. Uh, Mr. Cassins, the wash behind our complex is still collapsed. I wondered if you had a, had a somewhere on that priority list that we're going to be able to get to that. It is on the list, Tom. I wish I could tell you when they're going to get to it. They're, that, um, they're working on their top priorities, and that's on the priority list, and right. they will get to it. I know it's on the list. But I don't know what the calendar is, so I apologize. Did for it that. collapse after being fixed once? Yes, it did. Yeah, we wow. fixed it once. Yeah. You got a lot of washes to be worked, but it, it you collapsed have to again. Deal with BLM or or whoever we're dealing with, because you've already done the work once. But we had a big big storm go through right. last August, I think. Our, right. our, right our repair was, was tested and it failed. <laughs> <laughs> great, great, great. Well, okay. Well, I'll check on it again, but I know you're on the list because I checked once already. Chuck. Uh, back to the WIFA thing. Yeah. Uh, you said that the the bill has passed just the committees? No. It, it hasn't passed the legislature at all? No, it went through the Committee of the Whole in the, in the House and passed 42 to 16. Okay. So, um, so it has to go to the Senate now. It goes to the Senate. Um, we, um, we may ask to have it amended uh, to shore it up a little bit tighter. 
And if we do, then it would have to go back to the House. But Sonny Borelli's telling me that in the Senate, he thinks he'll get 25 out of the 30 votes. Is that enough to override if, if Doug Ducey doesn't sign it? Um, it w well, actually, where we're at right now, in each house, we'll have two thirds, which is an emergency measure, which that means, means it goes it, into effect immediately. Yeah, it goes into effect immediately. Right. So, um, but we're hoping. Um, the governor will sign it. We've been in contact, um, and there's, you know, governors will never tell you what they'll sign until it's in front of them on their desk. They just won't do that um, because they don't know what might change as the process goes along. But um, there is um, the a lot of support. Uh, sorry. The, the governor's advisors, policy advisors, have contacted us for information about it. So I know right. they're paying attention to it, but we're not sure. Uh, how much the governor himself might know about it at this point, but his office is definitely interested in it. Yeah, that's, uh, that would be the one thing that I would think that uh, that and the bill that you said that, that we'd like to put through, if, if it doesn't answer to anybody, it's, to me it's a rogue agency. Correct. Basically. Right. And I don't see how <coughs> legally they can put anything in. I think if you sue them in court, putting something in, to, to make somebody pay more. I just don't think that they could do it legally. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's our feeling as well. Um, but while we, what we would rather do is if they're not going to acquiesce, we'll, we'd rather fix it for all cities and towns as opposed to uh, WIFA just, because uh, if we don't, if we, let's say we sued and won, I'll guarantee you that WIFA or maybe even during that period of time, they'll start changing their agreements. They'll, they'll start twisting arms to get all their agreements changed to make sure that those penalties exist. We'd rather do it legislatively to say, nope, can't do it. Can't do it. Not unless that city agrees to it. And don't get me wrong, had we agreed to call features, I would have, I'd have nothing to complain about. We signed up for it, whatever. They signed up for call features, by the way, when they issued debt to the public, um, they, they agreed to 10-year call features and just assumed that we would honor their commitment to somebody else without putting it in our agreement. Right. And to be honest with you, I never wanted to get to this point. Had they worked with us, we would have never got to this point at all. Who the, likes these people? Well, the, um, what actually happens is that their board, the chairman of the board, is the executive director of ADEQ, the people that made us put in the sewer to begin with. Um, he, he is an automatic chair of WIFA. Now, as an executive director of ADEQ, he, uh, he does work at the pleasure of the governor. However, the executive director of WIFA only reports to that board. She does not report to the executive branch. And that's, that's where it fell down. So um, there are other appointees on that board. Um, a big surprise. I, I tried to get on the board, and they won't let me. Oh, geez, what a big <laughs> surprise. Um, the, um, but, yeah, but the treasurer's office did make an appointment. And I met with them, and they're definitely on our side. They, they, they are shocked of how that is being operated. Shocked. You know, the, the executive director is the one that's making all this decision? Pretty much. You know, and that's, that, that's a great point, Chuck, because we went to the board and basically the chairman of the board and said, look, you know, we, here, here's our situation. Here's why it's so important. Um, you know, we, we want to be able to make our payments and we don't want to default. We, we, we want to make sure that uh, we're able to do everything the right way, but we just need a little bit of help here. And because, again, all the debt is front-loaded just because of the way it got structured years and years ago. And he says, oh, I understand. Well, you know, you'll need to work with staff. Well, I know, but you have the ability to um, direct staff to, to a conclusion and whatever. Well, we pretty much do whatever they tell us. Well, then why do you need a board? Why do you need a board if that's the attitude? Sounds like staff's running it. It is. 
It is. That's exactly what's occurring. Joe. If, if you're going to write back to WIF and, and send them another deal back, uh, wouldn't it be better to wait and see what happens with this, this passage of this bill? Or, or, I mean, if they accept it, are you still going to bargain with WIF uh, on what you propose to them? Or if, would it be better to wait and see if you can get away from them? Or? Well, if, if they will, you know, it's funny. They came to us. They went through our attorneys. And um, our attorneys called us. And we thought we were going to be able to strike a deal. Because we literally said, look, we'll pay off um, a couple of our earlier loans. And we'll actually give them some of their penalty money. Um, coming up to a total of about $25 million. That's pretty much all we've got to do. And, it puts, and that puts us very close to a technical default on our debt covenants by doing that. But we figured we'd f find a way to manage that. And we said what we would do then is couple that with a new effluent project so they wouldn't have to call it a refi. And, um, and away we go. And we thought that was going to be, our attorney said, that's a great offer. I think you know we can work with that. And um, WIFA didn't want to hear about it at all. But one of the things that they did tell our attorneys was that um, when we strike a deal, we want Lake Havasu City to issue a press release saying that they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I told our attorneys yes, on Wednesday, they need to earn it. They need to earn it. So no, we're going to, that bill is putting pressure on them big time. They are fighting it tooth and nail. And so we are going to move forward with that bill. And we'll either go through because they never bothered to come to the table, or they're going to get their butts to the table. And, uh, but we're, we're, you know, we played nice for so many yeah, years. I, I think, um, if I may, Mr. Mayor, the, you bet. Um, the legislation, if that legislation goes through, what it does is removes their ability to charge us the, that extra interest if we wanted right. to pay them off early. Now, with the, with the plan that, that I plan to bring to council here in the next few weeks, uh, what it does is it, it, it does like the mayor says. We, we are going to uh, pay off as much as we can afford to pay off in, in the loans that we have outstanding. And what's left, we would take and, and do a new issue. Is, the city would issue its own bonds to cover what's left. And if the legislation passes, we can just pay off WIFA on the, the balance of those loans. If the, if the legislation does not pass and they still insist on charging us that extra interest, um, what we would do is take the, the proceeds from that bond sale that the city would do, put it into escrow, and then that escrow account would pay WIFA uh, as, as the city has been doing historically, the, the escrow account would do in the future. So the city would still have the debt, but we would be in total control of what, what debt the city has. And it would be a lesser amount because we had paid off those earlier loans. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what all of this effort that we've been going through in the last several years uh, with trying to find alternatives. And now I can honestly go to council and say we have looked at everything. And it has brought us to this point. This, and I'm going to have that recommendation that I just gave you, I'll be bringing to, to city council. And what that does is it basically. separate from WIFA. Yeah, there was some thought of um, going to the private sector for loans that have already um, met call features. Um, and then as new call features expire, again, go to the private sector. The problem with that is um, that we have pledged our revenues to pay off the WIFA loans. So to go to the private market and say, I want to pledge the same revenues makes it very, very difficult. So uh, we have been advised that while it's possible, your probably best course of action is to go out and just pay off WIFA so that you're only pledging to one group. 
because otherwise, what they basically said is if, if you're double pledging, you'll probably pay for that through interest rates. Right. So. Um, it's like using your collateral twice right. for two different loans. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's uh, a difficult situation, to say the least. Charlie, you said that, that even if the legislation passes and sign emergency order, that they could still say, well, we don't care what it says, that we're going to still charge it. They've said that already. Mm -hmm. These people must be a bunch of idiots. They've already said that. They've already said that they don't think this bill has any impact on them. Yeah, so it, it, it could, if the bill does pass, we would fully expect that it would ultimately be determined by, uh, by a court. Determined by a judge. And that doesn't help us in the short term. We're, we're the, the pressure is on us right now to take advantage of the lowest interest rates in history. It's, now is the time to strike. In fact, those interest rates are starting to inch back up. So we, you know, the pressure is on. And so we're, we're, we're done looking at stuff. I think we've looked at it all, and we're ready to settle on what, uh, what we feel is the most viable alternative and uh, does the most good for the city uh, in the short and long term. And, and we're going to hit it and be done with it. Yeah, it's time well, to fish or cut bait. So it goes to court. Who would defend it? The state's attorney general? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't think we need to. I, I'm, I'm, I, I doubt the state's attorney general. Uh, I mean, maybe. Um, it's his, it's his uh, thing to, to, to uh, defend any state law. Uh, Yes, and the U.S. Attorney. That's, yeah. the, that's a good question. Yeah, that'd be a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I, that, that would mean that the state would have to be a party to that, and I don't. Yeah. So. It'd be like the, that's the law. They have to be a party. Right. To. Yeah, it'd be like the state suing itself, which. Yeah. This is not out of the question, but um, yeah, it, that would be interesting. I, I don't know the answer to that, Chuck. Good question. Other questions. Yes, sir. I'm here representing Sunfield Drive. But I, Sunfield Drive, okay. By the high school named Jeff Libby. Mm -hmm. But anyway, since they put in the, all the stoplights at the high school, <clears throat> our streets become a raceway because everybody cuts through. And we've got different neighbors that have talked to the police department. They said they're not going to do anything about it. So we just kind of frustrated. Well, um, they say we can't come up there and set up radar because that's entrapment. I've never heard of such a thing. Well, so. what they can do, though, is put in that speed limit monitor. They've done that many times. Mm -hmm. They put that in, but as soon as it goes away, they're back to mostly the kids coming from the school or parents are shortcutting through there so they don't have to go through those lights down there. And it's mainly during school time. Sure. But, I mean, we've recorded some because I have a buddy that has a radar guy <laughs> doing 50 and 60 miles an hour down that street. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll touch base with the chief. Uh, there, you know, we can do a concentrated enforcement there. And, you know, once there's uh, a few tickets issued at that spot, usually the word gets out. So uh, that might be what's necessary. And we're, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> um, you know, some folks have, have asked for you know, speed bumps and things like that. Where and, I came from, that's what they did. And, speed bumps around the school. Streets. And <laughs> in most communities where those, where those residential speed bumps go in, they last a couple of years and then they come back out because they, they generate noise and, and uh, they, they don't really work, quite frankly. Um, so I think enforcement is the best tool. Yeah, I do And too. so uh, I can send a message to the chief and let him know that you were here and that we talked about it and uh, ask him to do a concentrated enforcement there. And the other point I had is the new beach that you built out on the front of the island facing north. The what? The new beach that's out there, you know, that they city graded and put all the big dumpster out there so people won't dump. Oh, that we cleaned up? Uh, oh, that beach. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, gotcha. Well, I noticed that since that's got done, they never got any fire rings out there. So now there's glass and pallets and nails everywhere down there because people are just building them everywhere. Hmm. And I thought they were going to put some fire rings out there. So did I. So did I. And there's no fire rings out there. And they don't put any garbage cans down below. They've got the bags there, but they got the dump. There's a right. reason for that. Okay. Yeah. The other thing is they've been camping out there, RVs, and the police don't go down there because they can't see it. 
Right. RVs down on the beach? Down below. Huh? Camping and they're, they're dump I go out there with a the dog every day. Mm -hmm. And so they're dumping gray water out there and they'll stay out there. There was one motorhome out there that was out there for a week. Okay. Yeah, right well, after the balloon. Jerry's, Jerry's making a note of it, and we will follow up on that. Thank you but for see, that. The city guy goes out there just about every time I'm out there. He goes out and checks that dumpster. But the police cars, they just stay on the road. They right. don't go out there. Yeah, we, we've tried putting the dumpster down by <laughs> the lake, and guess what? It turns into a boat. Hmm. Oh, yeah. I can imagine. So we, it's harder to drag it down to the beach the if we put it up above. The really helped out there yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah, so that's why we do it there. And if we put cans down below, they'll end up in the water. Yeah. You know, it, it's a shame because the community came together, got that beach cleared. We cleared a bunch of brush. It made it a very nice beach. And then people just come along and decide to destroy it, which is unfortunate. We'll, we'll follow up on that. Thank you for that. Yeah, I appreciate okay, it. You. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Uh, ball. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, we've heard rumors that, you know, the funds have been earmarked for some outdoor pickleball. Correct. Sports and, you know, one or more parts. And if this is true, uh, what are the details? I think it's Avalon Park, isn't it? Uh, actually, it's uh, Dick Samp. Dick Samp. I'm yeah, sorry. Dick Samp Park. Uh, we've uh, budgeted, I want to say, eighty or eighty-five thousand mm -hmm. dollars to put in pickleball courts at Dick Samp Park. Uh, I, I don't know where that project is, quite frankly, on the on the schedule. I think it's next year, if I remember right. Uh, Sixteen. Yeah, it could be. We're on a biennial budget at this point, and it may be earmarked for the next fiscal year, which would be sometime after J uh, July one. Um, it, it, we also thought we had permission from uh, the school district to use the old um, uh, tennis courts at Starline. I think it's Starline Elementary School. Right. And uh, we were looking at that. It looked like a very favorable spot. The tennis courts had fallen into disrepair and it had been used for a number of other uses. Uh, basketball courts and those fell into disrepair. But there, there was lights out there and it was fenced and it looked like a, a good prospect. And then uh, when I came back and, and uh, told the school district that we would, you know, we wanted to do pickleball courts there, um, they they let us know that they had changed their minds and that they had plans for that space now. So I know they have played there before. Yeah. Pickleball, but you, know, you can't go there during the day when the children are playing. Sure. Kind of yeah. So. Um, well, you pickleball people are pretty dangerous, so that's probably yeah. why. <laughs> yeah, you're running gangs. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. I'm another pickleball player. My name is Mike Delaney. I've been playing the game for old dang near 35 years. I first discovered it when I lived in Seattle when it first came out. I was delighted to see it start here, and delighted to see the growth in the number of people who are, who are playing. I, I estimate we probably have 150 players now, and I, I travel in the summer, but every year when I come back, there's like 20 or 30 new faces, so it's growing rapidly, and it'd be nice to have more courts. And, and I'm wondering, uh, in this 80 to 85,000, uh, do you know the scope of this, uh, how many courts you have in mind? That I don't know the details, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, now, if 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 your group, uh, you know, gets together and collaborates, we, you know, we certainly sit down and talk with you as a collective. If the group wants to invest in, in uh, pickleball courts somewhere in the city, we could certainly look at where those opportunities I, uh, lie. So th that might be an even better opportunity for for your group is to go beyond the scope of just what the city has planned and if you have more resources that you want to put towards it we would certainly uh, be interested in talking with you okay we're, we're all old retired people on vacation <laughs> <laughs> well the skate park we're all kids so um, so yeah i mean if you know it usually works a lot better is if you're willing to put a little skin in the game and that way, because, I mean, we, we can take the 80000 and build what we can. But if it isn't enough, then get your groups together and figure out what exactly it is what you want. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to pay for it. Like the skate park, they raised $175,000 just in fundraising. 
people who said, yeah, I want that thing built. How can we determine uh, how, how the scope of that project that you set aside uh, I can give you my card. If you want to uh, drop a note, I can get it to the people who would have that, and then they can get back to you. Would that work is for that you? Is that through planning, or is that through parks and rec? Uh, it's, on the cap it's on our capital improvements program budget, and so there, there are project managers assigned to each of those projects. I don't know who that, man that manager is, but that's who I would find, and uh, they could get with you and let you know what it is we have on the drawing board for that. That would be very helpful. Okay. You know, we've been talking about this for years now. And, sure. And, you know, we need to you know, try to come up with a solution somewhere. Uh, well, one of the things we did do, though, in, during that period of time is we revamped all of the aquatic center to make it easier for you to play and put a new floor, flooring well, in with that it. Was for everybody, too. But, but it, it was marked for pickle for courts. Right. And uh, there's 40 people playing on a three-hour uh, mm -hmm. time limit, and then they're doing three times a day. Not, not 40 people each time, because sometimes there's only sure. 20. Uh, so, you know, on a given day just there, there's, you know, 100 people playing. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, the art, uh, the church on uh, Jamaica, uh, has oh, three okay. courts there, and they're playing there. And, and it's full. Uh, so this is something that we need right. to address. And there's other places that we could play if we could just line them. Uh, you know, there's basketball courts. Uh, tennis courts in the city that aren't being used. You know, a lot of, if we just had lines, uh, or able to put lines on uh, the courts, we could bring our own nets and play. Right, <coughs> but, but I think most of those are on school district property. Well, I'm not talking about those tennis courts. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would be nice to play, oh, those are gorgeous courts. I, I got to commend the city and the parks and the school district for putting those tennis courts in there. That's, no. But we didn't. <laughs> a great place. No, we did. Yeah. And that was uh, part of a state grant for to do some of those with the signs there. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, Lemon Bridge Beach uh, has a basketball. Correct. Uh, it's not being used hardly at all. We could put three courts there if we just were able to put lines on that uh, basketball. Well, if you did that, then we'd find out just how much those basketball well, people want that, that space. <laughs> people want to play basketball. We could, we could have a sign saying basketball takes precedence over uh, tuckleball. I mean, and then you'd, you'd see how much it would. You know, that's just another place to play. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's Oops. a special event, we can't play at the aquatic center. Right. Uh, well, we, we can certainly look at the London Bridge Beach to see what, right. uh, and if it, it you know, usually what happens is, uh, I mean, if we do that, it could be that we'll have to run a schedule, and it, just like we do at the Aquatic Center. Yeah, uh, yeah. and, uh, you know, there's Yonder Park has room for one up there. Uh, there, there are a, a multiple uh, yeah, the, I, I, parks that, that could accommodate. The yeah, the Yonder Park might work. Um, it, but it would have to be restricted in hours because it backs right up to people's backyards, right, and, and, and I'd be hearing the, from them. Hear the, the football, right. And I understand that. Uh, it was just one that I just kind of recognized. Well, here's another one. You mm -hmm. know. Uh, right. Okay. Well, well we can it, look into yeah, those. Sir, obviously, you know, the city has its resources are limited, so um, uh, you know we may have space, but we may not just may not have the money. To, to do that. I know $80,000 doesn't seem like uh, much, and, it, and I'm not sure how, what that's going to build in the way of courts, quite frankly. But if you, like the mayor said, if you need more, then we can talk to your group. If, you, if your group can bring additional resources to the table, uh, you know, I've got, uh, I've got soccer, I've got two soccer leagues that are um, barking at us about uh, the need for more soccer fields and, and parking. and. Uh, so all of the sports, all the organized sports um, in the city are growing, and um, you know, our, our resources are limited. So we have to you know, prioritize, and we're doing this fields, this needs assessment study, and I think that's going to identify some opportunities on where we might be able to add courts. 
Uh, I don't know that um, in the scope of work if pickleball was included in the review, but certainly I can ask, and if it's not, then we can see if that's, if they identify spots that might not accommodate soccer fields or, or baseball fields or whatever the other playing field might be, maybe it could accommodate pickleball. So we could use that report to help identify some of those opportunities. But we, still, we, do, we don't have unlimited funds to just build what, you know, well, everything that people that. want. You're talking about building fields, you know, to bring, I mean, if we have, you know, a facility to play pickleball, we can bring in tourists. Uh, we had uh, a pickleball tournament just this mm -hmm. past weekend, and I, I imagine there was over 80 individuals. Not everybody played the, the men's uh, doubles or the mixed doubles, and uh, there were some people from uh, uh, Phoenix, uh, Surprise, Wickenburg. There were some from Vegas. But it was mainly a local thing that, that we put on every year, the last three years, and uh, it's been a fun tournament. Uh, we were down at London Bridge Beach, uh, and that's just a tennis court, or not London Bridge Beach, we were at the London Bridge Resort Tennis Court. Mm -hmm. That's just one tennis court. We had four courts on that. So it's not like it's a big area, you know, a soccer field or a baseball field. It's just a tennis court, you know, like, so if we had three, a size of three tennis courts, there could be, you know, upwards of 12 courts, and then, you know, eight, or, and then, you know, a little windscreen, a fence, uh, well, again, take a look at what we're planning, and if you want to and more than that, more then get your group to together. And, uh, you bet. Try to, uh, I was in construction most of my life, so, you know, I could probably find out some numbers, what it would cost to put a pad, uh, well, well, we know we know that it is. That's not the well, research we're talking that, about. <laughs> how much would that be for a pad? You know. Well, again, what I'm talking about is that if you want more than what we have allocated, uh -huh. then your group needs to get together and figure out how you can bring resources to bear to help. That's what we do with almost not all our parks, but many of our parks, whether it be little league or soccer or the skate park, you name it, the dog parks, you name it, that's how a lot of those get done. Um, even though we're doing a fields assessment it, in six months, it doesn't mean that we're gonna have hundreds of fields. We'll have to figure out how in the heck are we gonna pay for that if it is recommended that we put it together. So, um, but that's what I would do if I were you. Uh, one final question and then I'll sure. drop it up. Uh, the basketball court we were talking about earlier is down by the water. Uh -huh. uh, if we were to stripe it ourselves, are you going to throw us in jail? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Get permission, please. <laughs> and who do we ask? Uh, just uh, two years ago, the um, Chamber of Commerce's leadership group uh, paid to resurface that basketball court. Um, and I th I'm sure they would object if you were out there painting additional lines on there, as well as the people who do use that basketball court, and it is actively used. Um, they might object to, to having permanent lines uh, put on, on the basketball court. Um, so I, I would discourage you from doing that on your own. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Because that means would we ever do anything like well, that? Well, because then we just have to spend taxpayer dollars to go down there and undo what whatever it was that you did, and we don't want to do that. We, what would be the process of trying to convince someone to put lines on there? You know, at the aquatic center, I would there are three sets of lines. There's basketball, pickleball, and volleyball. And oh, and tennis. Oh, okay. On the aquatic center, so yeah. those are permanent lines, and it seems to work. I would su I would suggest that as far as the basketball courts are concerned, that you contact Dan Kyes, K E Y E S, uh, at the um, he's he's our recreation services uh, division manager, and uh, his number is four five three eight six eight six. And just uh, let him know what it is you're talking about, and you know he's the guy that's closest to all those activities, um, coordinates all everything that goes on in the community center as well as the the courts and the city parks. So he's he's your guy. 
Hey, Charlie. Yes, sir. I suggest that they do what temporary lines duct tapes up that expense. <laughs> Well, yeah, well, I'd, I, would, I wouldn't suggest that either because if you pull up the duct tape, you might lose some surface material. That wouldn't now, be good either. On the, the tennis courts, I know you probably can't answer this, but maybe you get back with it. Uh, they did come up with a new line system in pickleball to where we can lay the lines out and it's a heavy uh, material that we let lay it out and we bring our own nets. And then when we're done, we pick up the lines and our nets and we leave. And the high school tennis courts. We, 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 you have to talk to the high school. We don't, we, the, the district, the, high, the uh, school district is a separate governmental agency. We can't tell them what to do. Okay. Yeah. So you, you have to work directly with them. The, the, um, the city maintains those tennis courts. We have an agreement through an intergovernmental agreement with the school district right. to maintain the surfaces on those tennis courts. The city originally put in those tennis courts, but they are that is a school district facility. So you would need to, to anything different use of those tennis courts, it would all have to be approved through the school district. Right. And I had talked to some people that play tennis up there. Uh, and they said, oh, you can play on the upper two because they're not being used, and then you have the nicer six down below. But the upper two are locked during school hours, so you couldn't be using them. The other ones are open during the school hours. And it's not like, you know, that was just an option. I'm just trying to sure. talk about what are our options, and if we can make this happen and, and figure out a budget for, for that, mm -hmm. uh, would be great. Okay. And, uh, Do you have any? Yeah. yeah, my name is Lynn Bratton, and I'm a snowbird down here from a small suburb outside of Denver. Um, 112,000 uh, in Arvada. Arvada is encompassed by the Apex Parks and Recreation District. They just got through putting in 16 dedicated pickleball courts, eight of which are lit, and I believe they're going to add another eight courts, um, which will bring us up to 24. Um, and so it was suggested maybe that I share some points and observations of what I've seen down here. Um, I was introduced to pickleball last year and really enjoyed the game, uh, but have noticed that there are a lot of newcomers that want to get in over at the Aquatic Center. And uh, because of the limited number of courts and the number of players that want to use those courts, the beginners are being discouraged indirectly from, from playing. And so that's creating some hard, hard feelings uh, that the advanced players don't want to play with beginners. The beginners now are shunned by uh, people using those courts. And so I've heard that people are resorting to uh, lining uh, lining some of the washes out north of town to play pickleball outdoors. Um, and such things as that, anyway. And it, it seems to me like you've got a great community here, and I'm, I'm real impressed with the, the state park and the skateboard park and the aquatic center. And while I haven't been anywhere near all over town, I find it hard to believe that there aren't any public tennis courts that, that could be multi-use uh, pickleball courts. It would certainly be better than, than lining a concrete wash uh, to play. So uh, I, guess, I guess that's what I would ask is, is aren't there some, some public courts? Uh, that, uh, the, pu the public courts, the public tennis courts in Lake Havasu City are the tennis courts at the high school. Just, that's all there is. Huh? That's well, well, and you know the um, uh, you know what we have at the the community center. Um, you know we we don't have a a vast array of public tennis courts, but the the tennis courts that are at the high school uh, are considered the public tennis courts, and they are public tennis courts. But the high school it manages those tennis courts. Um, again, they, they, they were put in uh, by the city 
and as part of the agreement is that those are public courts and, and they will be open to the public, but they are managed by the school district. The, the city maintains them, the school district operates them. So uh, I would encourage you to, to, to continue your discussions at the school district, um, especially if, if there are systems that you could, um, that are temporary systems that you could take with you when you're done, I, I would think that would be uh, attractive, make it much more attractive proposition for them, but I, again, I don't speak for the school district. Um, can you play pickleball on the grass? No. So the ball has to bounce? I'm sorry, I don't know anything about pickleball. Well, you need to get out there and give it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of That's too much physical activity for me. Uh, several days with the coverage last week uh, surrounding the, the tournament. Um, and, and I don't want to misdirect your, your focus from putting in uh, new courts, dedicated pickleball courts, because I know the locals, as well as the snowbirds, would really appreciate something like that. Um, and like Doug says, you get people coming from out of state, and now you're putting heads in beds. Well, and uh, again, it's not that we don't want to put in pickleball courts. Uh, you know, I'd love to put in lots of pickleball courts and It, 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 the city can only do so much, and that that you know that allocation that we've made to put in pickleball courts at Dick Sant Park is is what we have on the books right now, and it will get done. And if you need something more than that, then we we would need to get that from you. Um, I'm just saying. It, and if if your group were to come to to call my office tomorrow and say we've got uh, you know two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and we want to build you know, 18, you know, a pickleball court stadium, I would say, come on in, let's talk. But... Uh, Can we have that on the water? <laughs> <laughs> Gonna have to ask the BLM on that yeah, one. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, again, we, we want pickleball courts too, but everybody's competing for those same dollars. Correct. So we could only have so much to work with. If you need more, then I'll talk to you. If you guys wanna bring more to the table, it, we'll, we'll make it whatever you can afford and what we can afford if we put it together, then you know, maybe we can satisfy those needs. It is one of the fastest growing sports in the uh, United States, so yeah, I would encourage you to go down to the athletic center and check it out. Thank you. June. Hi, I'm June Vaughn. Um, I have a friend that's in a wheelchair, and he lives off of Swanson mm -hmm. near the bowling alley. Mm -hmm. Well, several weeks ago, he got hit by a lady coming out of a bar. Oh, no. And uh, he fell out of his wheelchair, and she stopped, rolled her window down, and, are you all right? And he goes, yes, and she took off. But uh, he asked me if I could ask the city. Mm -hmm. um, he crosses Swanson at the new crosswalk that you guys, you know, uh, constructed. Going, I guess it's going east up on Swanson. I'm not sure which oh, one. It goes both ways. Okay. And he says that when you're coming up Swanson, you come up over the hill. He says people do not really see him in a wheelchair or they don't really see a child on a bicycle or a child walking. He says if you're going down Swanson, yes, you see him. He says, but many a times, he has to like stop his motorized wheelchair to let a car go by because they're coming up over the hill, they don't have time enough to stop while he's in this crosswalk. And he says, would the city be able to put in the flashing lights like what you have over there at the senior center on the coma? That at least there, when somebody short or a person in a wheelchair would be crossing, that they'd be able to, you know, you know, hit the light and the flashers would come on to warn the traffic that, you know, hey, there's somebody in that crosswalk. Because mm -hmm. I, I'm like, oh, gosh, that's strange, you know. So then I went up Swanson and I'm like, oh my gosh, he is right. Because when you go up that hill, you don't really see until you're almost down at the bottom and then, you know, there's might not be enough time for a person to stop. So I says, well, I'll give it a go and see, you know, 
June, are you talk are you talking about the crossing at, at Pima Wash? Yes. I thought I thought we had a crossing light there. There's signs. There's a sign, but I don't think there's a flashing light. Okay. Um, when, when they're going up the hill like this, they're facing up. Yeah. But once they top the hill, then when they can see somebody, right. it's too late. Well, we had a real problem there before we put in that uh, oh, yeah, well, the, the, the box culvert. Yeah, we uh, flattened it out. And it flattened it out, um, and we thought it flattened it out enough to where you could see somebody in that in that crosswalk. And I uh, well, uh, swear I thought we put in a flashing light there. Yeah, no kids on bikes walking or a person in a wheelchair. But yeah, I mean, uh, for, first of all, uh, uh, I hope he got a license number from the person who no, hit him, because it is state law that if somebody's in the crosswalk, you do have to stop for them. Um, that's not to say that everybody obeys all the state laws, uh, but that's, I mean, that's unfortunate. I, yeah, I'll look into that, definitely. I do have plans to put in four uh, crossing uh, lights, one on each side of the bridge, each end of the bridge, the London Bridge. Uh, particularly at night when it's dark, those crossings are terrible. And what we're going to do is not just one of the flashing yellow lights like we have at the golf course or the senior center. They're actually lights that are embedded in the in the street across the street in the in in the asphalt. And so when you push the light, I mean uh, the button, the ho the whole there's a row of lights that light up and flash in the street surface itself. And I was going to put two on, one on each end of the bridge, and then two in on McCulloch in the downtown area. Uh, but we can we can look at those crossings as well. I, I I had it in my mind that we had already put in a flashing light there, but apparently not. Uh, we'll we'll get that on the list. Jerry's Jake making a note. When you're going up heading east, you go up over that hill, you can't see oh, until you top the hill where you're heading back down. Yep. Good point. And uh, in, in before we put in that box culvert, it was a real problem, as I said. But and, and it, we even looked at you know moving the crosswalk you know t further towards the crest. And uh, it was decided that since we have the Pima Wash walking path, um, not in, not only in the wash but also where it crosses McCulloch, that if we were to put that big of a dog leg in it, the people would just ignore it anyway, and they would just cross right there at the wash. So we, we left it where it was, and uh, we're hoping that because the box culvert went in that people would be more easily seen. Now, someone in a wheelchair, that's a whole different profile, you know, coming up the hill. So, I, you know, we do the best we can. But we'll look into the flashing light thing. Yeah, the MPO is doing a safety study right now. It's possible they could... Yeah, in that. fact, we are... Uh, that we're about to undertake some major improvements and changes to Swanson Avenue. Right. And I will, uh, I'll make sure that we have some kind of crossing improvement uh, there, whether it's a light or the ones that are embedded in the street, or we'll, we'll make sure that that crossing is well, well lit. Thank you. Chuck. The, the other thing I was gonna bring up, do we still have that survey going on the the safety signs and stuff in the city. Is that survey going on still? Survey on safety signs. Now yeah, we, somebody wanted to use the the, the uh, way uh, wayfinding money, and they said, "No, you can't use that." I was watching it or listening to it on the TV. Well, we got an ADOT grant, right? And that was for changing out some of our old, you know, safety signs, yield signs, and uh, those, we have a lot of those signs that are aged and, and cracked and sunburned and need to be replaced, and so we got an ADOT grant to do that. Yeah, so that you'll be still going? S I don't know what you mean. The city? No, that's, no, that, that would be all finished now. They've got the list, and we applied for the grant, and we got the grant, so we'll be changing out the signs. Well, the reason I asked, we were in California at my son's house in Lancaster, Palmdale area. And I don't know if it's LA County that's doing this, or the state, or just the cities, but they're putting in uh, at stop signs all where the school this schools are, school areas, and the stop signs have small LEDs at mm -hmm. every point on that stop sign. Mm -hmm. Have a solar panel on it, and that, and they work day and night. Yep, I've seen them. And, that. and to me, even a, a yield sign 
would be good to have, you know, a yellow one for that. But, sure. Uh, I would really look into those. They, they're very impressive yep. around the schools. I, I have seen those. You're, you're right. They are very effective. I don't know if I'd want one in front of my house, but. Well, if you, if you, <laughs> if, if you put them to where, you know, where, where they would normally be and uh, maybe put a shield around them to keep it from going to the side or whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, to me, that would be very effective for these people that we were just left our house to come down here and come out our street to South Wind and people come down Rolling Hills, which is the next street, and come right through that stop sign. Don't even see it. Yeah. Anyone else? What time is it? Oh, we're close to nine o'clock, I guess. I got one more thing, Charlie. Go for it. <laughs> Did you know that there's no, you know, we're not supposed to be swimming in the channel, uh, across the channel and stuff like that. Right, you're not doing that, are you? No. <laughs> You're on camera, remember. Yeah. Hate, to, hate to have to put you in jail with the pickleball guy. <laughs> They're pretty rough, you know. Well, did you know there is no ordinance in the town that says a dog or an animal can't cross that? There's people out there throwing the balls across the channel and let their dogs swim out there and get them and bring them back and stuff like that. I talked to you, in fact, I've seen your uh, animal control officer's little thing on Channel 4, mm -hmm. and uh, very effective in that. That's why I called him to ask him about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, he looked it up and he says, there's no law that says an animal can't cross it. Well, if they're crossing on the London Bridge beach side, there is a law that requires that animal to be on a leash. But that's uh, only past the, the seawall. Uh, down on the down on the sand and that, he said that's not required. Well, it's no, it's still in the city now. At the very least, I mean, the city does not have a leash law per se. Um, you know, a lot of folks think that the city, all cities, have a leash law. We don't have a leash law. Um, what we have is a you must keep your animal under control at all times law except in the parks. If you're in city parks, that animal has to be on a six-foot leash. That's the only place we do have a leash law. Right. But in Rotary Park, you can't, you can't, you can't take have a, dog a dog to at Rotary all. Park at all. Right. That's, our, that's a dog-free park. Yeah. So, what I'm saying is, that was the other thing I asked him, was that the people that pull up with their boats down on the London Bridge side, mm -hmm. on the island side, they would let their dogs out, and the first thing they do is get up over that seawall and bug all the animals that are people are walking up there. Well, that's, that's the, uh, that would be the appropriate time to contact animal control. Yeah, they, they will, no sign telling the people they don't. They yeah, will they don't respond. Have. They will respond. But what I'm saying is. Well, we do have, uh, I'm sorry, we do have signs down there that do say that the dogs have to be on a leash. But is that facing down towards the sand? Yes. Or is that as you're walking in the park? No, it's facing down towards the sand. There's those, um, I beg your pardon, they may be facing um, either side or fire department uh, to identify various locations in the channel. Each one of those signs down there has a number on the side of it. So that if you're ever listening to law enforcement on the radio or the scanner, you'll hear them refer to, you know, a, a someone at sign five or sign twelve. Uh, and those signs right. actually have, those are the no, no, no signs. Uh, you know, no, uh, it's uh, alcohol free or uh, whatever, right. uh, no swimming in the channel and uh, animals must be on a leash and that kind of stuff. So there are signs. I would, I, I, I don't have them memorized, Chuck, but I, I, I do know that uh, at least one time there were signs down there prohibiting that. Now, as far as people who, who don't care about signs and just let their animals run free, uh, you know, their uh, animal control is interested in those. I mean, that's why we put the, the dog park in down there. Is people wanted a, an off-leash area, so that's what the dog parks are for. Right. Um, and, but if they're elsewhere in the park, they have to be on a leash, and you have right. to pick up after them, and you have to do, you know, you're supposed to do lots of things that a lot of people don't do. So, um, you know. Yeah, I, I would have suggested as having a sign on the seawall itself saying, 
must be on, dog must be on a leash past this point. Yeah, you could, but the problem is that seawall is how many hundreds of feet long? So how many signs and... How many entrances is there, is there from out there that goes down to the, to the sand? People don't, they just go over the seawall. Yeah. They just walk over the seawall. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if... The I mean, thing I was talking about was people throwing balls and frisbees and stuff out into the channel. Yeah, they're not supposed to be doing that either, but and, uh, they do. And, that's, and they let their dogs swim, but he's, he's the, your dog, your enforcement officer said there's no law against it. There's one for people, well, none for dogs. Yeah, so well, you could argue that it, there is a law because uh, if they're in the middle of the channel, they do not have control over that animal. Yeah, if, if the animal control officer uh, you know, saw a situation that needed immediate correction, certainly we have enough ordinances on our books that they would be able to, um, you know, to correct that situation. And, uh, or a police officer, I mean, there, if, if somebody's being a knucklehead down there and, and they want to argue the points, then certainly, you know, law enforcement can be called in. Uh, but dogs that swim across the channel, you know, if they're causing trouble for, or dogs that are in the park harassing other animals or people, certainly that's a condition that we, we would want to stop. And whether it be through animal control or law enforcement, um, we, we could certainly find a way to do that. You don't have any concept of what goes on down there, what he's talking about. I have a lot of experience down there. I have two blue healers. I walk them on, uh, they both have halters on and they have a crossover leash and I have a leash to control them because Supposedly, it's a $500 fine if you don't have your dogs on a leash in the city. I don't know whether that's true or not. That's what I was told two years ago by the previous animal control officer. Your current, you don't have enough animal control officers exploring down there because the folks that come here, the, the snowbirds that come here, they come down there. You have a sign at the dog park that says animals must be on a leash beyond this. But according to the animal control officer, Two years ago, between the sea walls and the channel, that's county county property. And this, no, I'm it's just telling you what I was told. And he is correct. They come out of there. They don't put the dogs on the leash. They go over that wall. They're out there playing. My two blue healers are under control. Their dogs are not. Now I can't tell you how many times I've had to grab that double leash to keep my dogs, which mm -hmm. are not under voice control, but because they were cow dogs at one time. They're not under voice control. I have to grab that leash. That other dog's come in. I also carry a walking cane, that, that I, or a hiking cane, that I use to put in the face of the dog that's coming in. I've had to do that twice um, before, but you have no concept of what goes on in that dog park. And the animal control, and I, I know that he's the only person that covers the whole city. No, we have, we have two. Told. You may have two, two. We have but two. you don't have enough down there in the morning because in the morning and in the afternoon when yeah. you're walking, you have most dogs running loose down there. Well, actually, uh, you know, that's correct. We, we have two animal control officers, per se. Animal control is, is in the police department. If the animal control officers are tied up or otherwise unavailable, they will send a police officer. I understand. So that. we have the ha we have the resources of the entire police you department. Don't send them down there to control them at the appropriate times. When do you call? Did you call? Me. I call, and it doesn't do any good. The guy says I'm over here at such and such place, and I understand that I'm not. You call dis You call dispatch. Officer. You called the police department? You called dispatch? By the time, yeah, and they say, well, by the time we get there, the person will already know, which is true. This, these are, these well, are short increments of time when people are coming out of the dog park. Okay. And it really is a frustration to me to have them come out there and do that. And you can tell by my voice and by the intensity of that that you don't have enough control. You, the city, do not have enough control of that dog park because that is the most concentrated effort. Sarah Park, I've been up there. You know, and, and I can't release my dogs inside the fence because, like I said, they're not under voice control. But I walk my dogs down at the beach, and they're on that leash. Other people do not do that. All you have to do, and if it is a $500 fine, you can make a lot of, you can make a lot of money off of that because I count the number of dogs out there, and if it was $500 a dog, you'd make $3,000 a day if I'm only there for a couple hour period. 
sorry for being so intense. No, no, I, and I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have the resources to park somebody down there on the wall, you know, all day long I to, to watch. Well, the park unless they put them on a leash. I yeah. know that's impossible to do, yeah. but that's just a comment. Okay, thank okay. you. A friend of mine asked me, do you have a, a time or are they going to put a light at Daytona and Acoma anytime soon? Uh, it's not it's yeah. not in our plan as oh, far as I know. He just lives down the street on the coma and he said he can't get out of his driveway at some yeah. time, you know. We we do have a, a very comprehensive um, traffic monitoring program. Uh, you will notice around town at any given time uh, there you know there will be those little squares that are taped down in the middle of the street and those are taking traffic counts and the reason that we do that is to monitor to see where um, you know what our traffic counts are doing and if in fact there are intersections or might be intersections that are being close to what they call warranted which means that they warrant some kind of additional traffic control like a signal light or a new stop sign or whatever the case may be so we uh, that uh, Mark Clark runs that program and he does it in a very comprehensive way so I'm I'm sure that if it's approaching warrants, that uh, at one at some point I will see it on the um, on the recommended capital improvement program, and uh, that's that's how it gets to me. Now, of course, there have been stop signs placed uh, by you know per public demand. Um, the, the intersection at Rainbow and Acoma uh, is has stop signs there, not because it meets the warrants for a stop sign, but because the people who live in the area essentially. You know, they, they wanted stop signs there and they petitioned council to get stop signs there and now there are stop signs there. And, um, well, so there's stop signs at Daytona and Acoma. Oh, well, yeah, but you're talking about putting in a traffic a light, light, though. A light, so yeah. you know, they would stop the traffic to where it was, to where you could get out. It, right. it might stop the traffic. you got to remember, you can make a right turn on right, red. Right. I understand yeah. that. And so. you just asked me, hey, if you're going to ask me about it. <laughs> I think he's asking yeah, I honestly, I, I, I really don't think you're going to see a traffic control signal there anytime soon anyway. Uh, just, be, just given the nature of the kind of, the, it's a T intersection, it's not a four-way, and um, if, if, I know there are times when it's busy that the traffic on Daytona does back up because, they're, you know, the, right, the best, the, what, the best thing that traffic lights do is they, they can create a break in the, the stream of traffic so the other side mm -hmm. streets can have a chance to get in there. Uh, and, and they monitor for that as well, too, that traffic and that program that uh, I was referring to earlier. You know, we look at that as well. So uh, I can tell you that it's, it is something that we monitor, but I don't have anything on my desk that suggests okay. that there will yeah, be a traffic light there that. anytime soon. I know it's getting late, Charlie, but... Yep, uh, we're over time now, Chuck. Okay. <laughs> Pay your over. Uh, does our motor officer, we still have a two motor officer? Yes, sir. Uh, do they deal strictly with speed when they sit out someplace? Well, they're traffic, they're traffic control. I mean, they're, they're, they're sworn police officers, so... I mean, they can be called into law enforcement duty uh, um, in any way, but... Their primary function is in traffic, traffic control right. and traffic enforcement. Because I, we see them every once in a while, my wife tells me, that when you start from Mulberry towards where it turns into Jamaica, he sits over there on the left-hand side. And I don't know if he does not see or if he's too far away or what, but there is people constantly making a right turn on red off of 95 and from with Capitu Avenue onto, you know, they, they turn and they have to sit there right in everybody's way uh, before they, they want to cross over and go south of 95. And they're constantly doing that. Hmm. Okay, I can, uh, I, you know, I can uh, pass that on to um, the police department. Uh, it's that concentrated enforcement thing. If there's an area that has a particular problem, like what this gentleman was referring to earlier, 
we can do a concentrated enforcement and it's my opinion that um, you know more signs and more lines and all of that kind of stuff uh, don't always fix the problem but if you go out there and you knock a couple of heads every once in a while that word gets out so mm -hmm. so um, uh, that something that we can look at for sure well yeah if it, if it hits you in the pocketbook though that that can hurt most of all so Okay, next uh, coffee will not be the first Friday of April because that's Good Friday, so we're going to move it to April 10th. Uh, it will be at Mackay Cafe, 7.30 to 9. So Mackay Cafe is just under uh, Barley Brothers right there. So, And if it's really nice weather, we might be able to sit outside, but we'll see. That would be nice. That would be nice out there by the water. So. Um, as long as you have a whole lot of noise. Probably April, uh, that early in the morning, you think it's spring break? They won't be up. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be nice and quiet. It'll be nice and quiet. <laughs> all right, thank you all very much for being here. We, we really do appreciate it. Thank you.